other ruler in Egypt's history was like him. He was the greatest of them all, the pharaoh of pharaohs. Even as a boy, he dreamt of becoming a mighty ruler with absolute power over the kingdom of the Nile. He set himself superhuman goals. No one should ever topple his statues. He wanted to outshine all his ancestors, even those who had built the pyramids. He led the Egyptians into the most famous battle of all their military campaigns and signed the world's first peace treaty. He longed to become immortal and built memorials to eternity because he wanted to control his country's fate forever. He reigned for longer than any of his predecessors. He would be 90 before he would take his rightful place at the side of the gods. In 1279 BC, his boyhood dreams came true. Egypt and all its subjects lay at his feet. He was master of both crowns, the Golden Horus, rich in years and great in victories, king of Upper and Lower Egypt. In the throne room of the palace, the high priests pronounced him king and anointed him with holy oil. He was the master of thousands of their number throughout Egypt. Together with the pharaoh himself, the priests shaped the country's fate. The priests who would one day prove the undoing of the darling of the gods presented him with the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. At only 25, Ramses was lord of the world. I was a child when I became ruler. The Almighty himself gave me the earth when I was still in my mother's womb. I am descended from the god Ra, who educated and raised me. In this speech to his court, Ramses insisted on his divine descent, and that was his name in hieroglyphics. Ra, the disk of the sun and symbol of the god Ra. The child figure stands for to beget, to be born, and the rush stands for him, so Ramses means Ra begot him. The falcon god watches carefully over the child. Legend has it that he predicted the crown prince's elevation to kingship. And this is exactly how Ramses illumined his childhood, destined by providence to rule the country. Shrewd propaganda, but the truth was quite different. When Ramses was growing up, Egypt was going through a period of growth and prosperity. The country was not threatened by war. His grandfather, a professional soldier, had founded their dynasty, and Seti I, his father, had consolidated their power. At first, Ramses wasn't the crown prince. He was 22 when the pharaoh appointed him his heir. Until then, he had lived as one among many in his father's harem. The boy could only dream of one day holding the reins of power over all of Egypt in his hands, of soaring protectively over the land along the Nile like a falcon, the royal symbol. When he ascended the throne, he immediately started to eradicate any trace of his predecessors from the temples, especially any reference to the heretical king Akhenaton. It was Akhenaton who had outlawed all deities except Aton, the sun, thereby founding the world's first monotheistic religion. In so doing, Akhenaton and his famous wife Nefertiti started a religious revolution. The heretical king's dream lasted for 13 years until his fanaticism estranged him from his own people and drove the kingdom to the brink of collapse. The pharaoh had become oblivious to everything except his sun god, Aton, whom he praised in an epic hymn. Before moving to his new capital, Amarna, 
Akhenaten had the statue of Egypt's national god Amun torn down, the temple at Karnak closed, and his priesthood disbanded. Thousands of cubic meters of time-honored stone structures were razed to the ground. After Akhenaten's early death, the old order was quickly restored. Amun and the priests returned. After all, how could a cult survive if it robbed the servants of the national god of their power? For nearly a thousand years, Amun's great temple at Karnak had been the nation's religious heart. Seti I embarked on its restoration. But it was Ramses who initiated a gigantic building program, which no other pharaoh would ever equal. During the first year of his reign, Ramses first had to appoint a new high priest. To ensure that his favorite, Neb Wenen F, was selected, Ramses asked the oracle to speak at the annual Opet festival. The shrine was carried into the temple courtyard in a solemn procession, and the list of candidates was read out. Only when it came to the name of Neb Wenen F did Amun apparently indicate his approval. Prior to his appointment, Neb Wenen F had neither belonged to Amun's priesthood nor to the temple at Karnak, and it's certain that Ramses made a lot of enemies by choosing him. In gratitude, the chosen candidate had the pharaoh's welcoming speech carved into the wall of his tomb. You shall be the first prophet of God, and both his treasury and his storehouse shall be under your seal. You shall be the highest speaker of his temple, and his entire revenue shall be under your control. The construction of the magnificent hypostyle hall at Karnak alone would have guaranteed Ramses his immortality. The forest of 134 columns standing 15 meters high seems too immense to have been created by human hands. But it didn't end there. The pharaoh was overwhelmed by a frenzy of construction and covered the whole country with temples. Starting from the old capital, Memphis, he commanded holy cities to be extended or rebuilt for more than a thousand kilometers up the Nile. All the way to Abu Simbel, beyond Egypt's borders in Nubia. Along the Nile, Egypt's wealth bloomed. The granary of the Middle East didn't only feed its own citizens, more than once, Egypt's abundance of grain saved people in neighboring lands from starvation. But the country's prosperity depended on the timely arrival of the annual floods, which meant the peasants could bring water to higher ground and thus expand the cultivated land. This flooding brought a rich layer of mud to the fields, a natural fertilizer, which ensured three or even four harvests a year. But if several floods failed in succession, the granaries emptied and starvation threatened. The people also used the Nile's mud to make bricks for building their houses. The damp bricks baked quickly under the hot sun. Even the palaces of the rich were built from this impermanent material. Stone was too precious for such projects. It was reserved for monuments intended to last forever, temples, statues, and the tombs of the early pharaohs. The Cheops pyramid alone swallowed up over two million blocks of stone. But Ramses set out to eclipse all these earlier monuments in glory. And indeed, later generations called him the Great. Following ancient tradition, young Ramses was taught how to use the weapons of war. But his reputation as an undefeated strategist was a mere fabrication. Pictures of prisoners of war on the walls of temples glorified his victories and conquests. By the time Ramses came to power, all of Egypt's neighbors were paying their tribute. Only one small kingdom to the north of Palestine still had to be brought under his control. When Ramses mounted a successful campaign against it, his soldiers sang his praises as the protector of Egypt and conqueror of foreign lands. But then he took on the Hittites. The Egyptians had been in armed conflict with them for generations. 
in the fifth year of his reign, the young pharaoh decided to drive this wretched enemy out of Asia Minor once and for all. Ramses set out from Memphis with four divisions of 20,000 men. The backbone of the army consisted of 5,000 two-wheel chariots. Each was manned by a shield-carrying driver and a man-at-arms. Near the town of Kadesh in present-day Syria, the two armies clashed in a battle which was chronicled on both sides. It was a remarkable sight. For the first time ever, an Egyptian pharaoh and a Hittite king met face to face. I defeated them all, I alone, for both my infantry and my charioteers had all deserted me. This is what Ramses reported. But it wasn't strictly true. He wasn't left entirely alone although he was forced into a desperate fight against a numerically superior enemy. Muwatali, the legendary Hittite king, had lured Ramses into a trap and cut him off from the rest of his forces. The Egyptian troops that followed up eventually were just able to rescue their pharaoh in the nick of time. He was unhurt, but instead of risking a second battle against Muwatali's forces, which outnumbered them two to one, the Egyptians retreated. But in an unprecedented propaganda exercise, Ramses effectively reversed his ignominious defeat. He had the Battle of Kadesh depicted in many temples. They were correct in every detail, except that they represented him as the great victor, grinding his foes into the dirt. After all, pharaohs at that time were expected to defeat their enemies. At least, Ramses' political insight had saved his army from total destruction. And years later, as is documented in his funerary temple, the Ramesseum at Thebes, the master diplomat brokered a peace treaty with the Hittites, the world's first, and married one of the king's daughters. Free from the burden of waging war, Ramses devoted himself instead to his love of monumental splendor. But was he also the pharaoh mentioned in Exodus when the Israelites were forced to flee Egypt? The Old Testament tells of the tribes of Israel who had immigrated generations earlier. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, and he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Patom and Ramses. Pharaoh had his new seat of government, Pyramus, constructed in the Nile Delta. It was a splendid capital, which replaced Memphis. Were they his soldiers and chariots which foundered in the Red Sea as they chased the fleeing Israelites? Was it Ramses the Great who negotiated with Moses in the Bible? The one time the name Israel appears in Egyptian texts gives no clue as to the date of the Exodus. This stele celebrates the victories of Ramses' son and successor, Meir and Patach, over Libya and Gaza. Further down it says, Israel lies fallow and has no seed. So there was a tribe called Israel living in Palestine at that time, but whether they were the refugees from the lands of the Nile isn't clear. Ramses the Great saw himself as a divine ruler. He had gigantic idealized figures of himself 20 meters high hewn out of the rocks at Abo Simbul. It was propaganda in stone. But he didn't stop there. He dedicated a second cult temple to his great royal consort, Nefertari. In doing so, the pharaoh elevated his beloved wife to the status of a living goddess. Doubtless, an enormous provocation for the conservative priesthood. Only once before had something similar happened. The site of Nefertari's temple near Egypt's gold mines in far-off Nubia was not chosen by accident. The ancient Egyptians believed that certain constellations of stars released cosmic energy which could rejuvenate the pharaoh and make him immortal. Since the dawn of time, people had attributed great importance to the movement of the stars. In fact, the Egyptians arranged their whole lives accordingly. The architects of Abu Simbel were well versed in astronomy. No other construction in Egypt linked their concept of cosmic order so clearly to its monarchy. 
Eight figures of Ramses stand in full royal regalia in the hall of the great temple, ensuring the floods will come each year, thus guaranteeing the country's wealth. Twice a year, the rays of the rising sun, symbolizing rebirth and renewal, penetrate 64 meters into this holy of holies. They illuminate the statues of the gods Amun and Re, and in the center, the divine Ramses on the 20th of October when sowing begins and on the 20th of February when harvesting begins, the most important days in the Egyptian calendar. At Abu Simbul, Karnak and all other temples in the country, countless priests serve the glory of the gods and their pharaoh. For he too was regarded as a god who was ruling the country temporarily and would return to heaven after his death. This meant that the ruler had an exclusive relationship with all other deities. As the highest in the priesthood, he had to ensure their goodwill by staging holy ceremonies and sacrificing incense, food and drink. In reality, pharaohs delegated this function to a chosen figure in each temple, who was appointed and could just as easily be removed. At Karnak, Ramses chose Neb Wenen F. As the first prophet of Amun, the god's highest servant, he was the king's representative in the cult. He held sway over whole armies of priests and officials arranged in a strict hierarchy. There was much to do in a temple, religious rituals three times a day, the cleaning and maintenance of the building and the administration of goods. Staff were paid from the temple's revenues and serving in a temple was considered a lucrative job. Priests had to follow the dictates of ritual cleansing by washing in the holy lake and removing all hair from their bodies. They had to wear linen robes and sandals and follow other strict rules. But a holy man was not obliged to live in seclusion. A high priest, however, was hardly ever seen outside the walls of his temple. In 1248 BC, there was great excitement in the streets of Thebes. In a few days, Ramses would celebrate his first Sed festival, an important event in the lives of his people. Everyone was allowed to join in the festivities. After 30 years, and thereafter in shorter intervals, the aging pharaoh's forces were symbolically renewed. It was even rumored that the high priest was going to attend. They wanted to see him most of all, for he had an important role in the festival. Would the gods once again confirm the pharaoh in his position, as they had at his coronation? In the past, priests had deposed rulers who had become feeble. But Ramses knew he could rely on Neb Wenenef. The man who pulled the strings of religious power was unswervingly loyal to him. At the gigantic temple to Amun at Karnak, the seat of the high priest, the pharaoh with a mania for building realized his architectural dreams, which portrayed him as a divine ruler. The sacred site had been founded almost a thousand years earlier. Each king had erected monuments to himself there, carving his name and deeds in stone, and each had sought to outdo his predecessors. But none managed this as successfully as Ramses. He would reign for 67 years, celebrating his divine rejuvenation at 14 anniversary festivals. Hundreds of thousands of workers labored at his behest in every province of the kingdom. One of the king's speeches to them has been preserved. Oh, you workers, chosen, strong, with skillful hands, who are erecting monuments to me without number. Oh, you hard workers who never tire and who perform their duties diligently. It is my wish that you be well cared for, so I may preserve you well. Such words had never been heard from a pharaoh before, but Ramses had every reason to praise his workers. No king built such immense obelisks as memorials. No king ordered the construction of so many stone needles, the skyscrapers of antiquity. They had to reach up to the heavens, for the sun god himself was to rest on their once golden tips. 
more than a thousand tons of granite was hewn from the quarry at Aswan for the construction of a single obelisk. For a long time, archaeologists were at a loss as to how the ancient Egyptians could have performed these almost superhuman tasks with the simple tools at their disposal. At first, they bored deep holes to establish the quality of the stone. Then they painstakingly chiseled the sides free, using heavy hammers fashioned from dolerite, which is harder than granite, advancing perhaps five millimetres every hour. If the stone cracked or shattered, they had to start again. It would have taken several hundred piece workers to hammer a 30 meter long monolith out of the rocks and smooth it in only seven months. If the obelisk survived the long, dangerous journey to one of the temples and arrived intact and undamaged, it was erected and inscribed. It was a marvel glorifying the pharaoh, praising the gods and delighting the people. After Napoleon's Egyptian campaign in the early 19th century, the French plundered the land along the Nile. They even stole Ramsey's most beautiful obelisk, which stood at the entrance to the Temple of Luxor. Today, it stands at the Place de la Concorde in Paris. Only two of the six colossal statues that Ramses commissioned remain. Thousands of years ago, Egypt's greatest ruler himself also stole in order to establish his presence at all the holy sites. Even his own father fell victim to this megalomania. But Ramses was really only doing what his predecessors had done, usurping monuments for his own purposes. He sent workers out in all directions to remove names from monuments and replace them with his own. They also had to learn a new technique. Until that point, the background around each hieroglyph had been chiseled away. Now the symbol was carved straight into the stone. This so-called sunken relief was much faster to produce than a raised one. This was how Ramses was able to leave his mark on the whole of Egypt in such a short time. His ambition became boundless, to gain immortality in thousands of monuments. But this new relief technique makes it relatively easy for experts to tell which monuments were originally dedicated to other pharaohs. The temple masons were often in too much of a hurry to eliminate previous names and royal titles in their entirety. And Ramses didn't always notice every mistake when he came to inspect the work either. Only one thing mattered to him, that his name should become immortal. Ramses' monuments stretched up the Nile from Pyramis like pearls on a string. And as more and more temples were built to feed his insatiable appetite for glory, so the power of priests who administered them also increased. He was well aware that the temples paid no tax on their goods. All income went to the gods and therefore the priests. Even a pharaoh was powerless to change that. What visions drove him? His sole aim was to become a god. By the 23rd year of his reign, the huge rock temple of Abu Simbel was slowly nearing completion. Ramses dedicated it to Amun and the sun god Ri Harachta, who, as the records say, beamed with joy at the sight. In the center of the facade, there's a portrayal of the god, not a particularly striking scene at first glance, but it also pays homage to Ramses himself. Taken together, the disk of the sun, the scepter in the hand of the god, and the figure of the goddess Maat mean Uza Maat Ra, the just rule of Ra is strong. Since Ra formed part of the royal name, Ramses, he had elevated himself to the level of the sun god. Each of the four colossal statues also bears its own divine name. Ramses, son of the rulers. Ruler of both kingdoms. Beloved of Amun. And beloved of Atum. Each statue represented a divine aspect of the pharaoh himself. In the Holy of Holies, Ramses sat alongside the main gods of Egypt. The masons were to put him in third place after Ptah and Amun, and right next to Ra, thereby making him immortal.
The walls of the temple depict the oldest of his 45 legitimate sons, for the ruler wanted his glory to extend to his family too. At the feet of the pharaoh, time and again, his favorite, Nefertari. Flowery words praise her as princess, mistress of charm, and singer with beautiful features, for whatever she says will be done for her. She was only one of the king's seven main consorts, but she was his undisputed favorite. Her husband's harem contained both the most beautiful women of Egypt and the daughters of foreign princes. This establishment provided support for them, their children and female relatives. The less important wives only attained public exposure if they gave birth to an heir to the throne or were charged with plotting against the ruler. The foreign women were virtual hostages, usually married to the pharaoh for political reasons. Of this group, only the Hittite king's daughter shared Nefertari's status as great royal consort because her father had negotiated a marriage contract to this effect. Nefertari bore Ramses his eldest son, although he died long before his father. There are many indications that she had an important official function at her husband's side. Nefertari, for whom the sun shines, was the dedication inscribed on her temple at Abu Simbel. Two figures of the pharaoh decorate the facade, with his favorite wife in the center. The holy site is dedicated to Hathor, goddess of love and music, and therefore also to Nefertari herself, for she was the embodiment of Hathor. The godlike lady holds a sistrum, a type of rattle, and a papyrus branch. Larger-than-life heads of Hathor, with her typical hairstyle, are to be found on the pillars of the hall. And the highlight, the crowning of Nefertari by the goddesses Hathor and Isis, a unique event which was usually reserved for the pharaoh. For 25 years, Nefertari, which means the most beautiful, stood at the great Ramses' side. Then death parted the royal couple. Nefertari left the world of the living, apparently shortly after the pharaoh had dedicated the rock temple at Abu Simbel to her. Before her body could be buried, it had to be prepared for eternity. This required a great deal of perfume and preservatives, for the ancient Egyptians believed they could only survive in the hereafter with a perfectly preserved body. Over the centuries, they became experts at mummification. This long and expensive procedure was performed by specially trained embalmers. There were strict rules. First, the corpse was washed, and then the internal organs removed through a small incision in the stomach. They were cleaned, dried, and placed in special containers for burial. Sometimes they were even put back in the body. Only the heart, the seat of feelings, thought and understanding, was left in its original place. The brain was also removed, using a hook inserted through the nose. The skull was later filled with liquid resin or other stuffing. This was followed by the most important stage, desiccation. The body was packed in sodium salt for 70 days to remove all moisture from the tissue and prevent it from decomposing. Finally, the body was rubbed with expensive perfumes and wrapped in fine linen bandages. For the heart of the deceased was to be as light as a feather when it entered the spirit world. He would have to account for all his actions at the seat of judgment. Anubis, the jackal-headed guardian of the underworld and god of embalming, would then weigh the heart against the feather of truth. The heart was to float like a down feather, unburdened by even the slightest sin. If the scales didn't balance, the heart was swallowed by a monster and the sinner abandoned to eternal death. 
but eternal life awaited those who passed. Wearing the mask of Anubis, Ramses followed the body of his beloved wife. At the entrance to the burial chamber, he performed the final ritual, the opening of the mouth. By touching the sense organs and burning incense, the corpse was symbolically reanimated. Artists have preserved this moment for eternity in her tomb. Nefertari could once again eat, drink and speak. The holy ritual had brought her back to life again, an essential step on the road to the hereafter. Throughout Egypt, this road began with the crossing of the River Nile, which separated the kingdom of the living in the east from the kingdom of the dead in the west. Strict rules governed the course of the procession. Only if all these rules were meticulously observed and all the burial rituals carried out could the deceased gain access to the kingdom of the dead. Be safe, be safe. In peace, in peace. To the west, to the west. The priests constantly recited words of welcome spoken by Osiris, ruler of the hereafter, who grants permission for life to continue after death. You shall sail downstream in the evening bark and upstream in the morning bark. May Osiris grant you millions of years. For just as a person was buried in the earth to the west, so the aged sun god Ra entered the kingdom of the dead every evening on the western horizon, there to be united with Osiris. In the twelve hours of the night, Ra travelled through the hereafter in his bark, waking up its inhabitants, the dead. At dawn, the revitalized god rose in the east as the new morning sun. Many magic spells were used to conjure up Ra's nightly rejuvenation. These were collected together in books for the underworld and placed in the grave with the dead body. Friezes in the temple show this ritual was also observed for Nefertari's last resting place. Other scenes show her making sacrifices. The gods loved the wine which the royal lady offered them. Just like mortals, they needed regular sustenance. At the beginning of this century, an Italian archaeologist discovered the finest grave in the Valley of the Queens. It had been completely plundered, its mummy stolen, and the paintings were in poor condition. The extensive renovation necessary has only recently been completed. Now the colours shine with their old brilliance again. The best artists of Egypt lent eternal beauty and grace to the woman Ramses loved so dearly. And it's certainly no coincidence that Nefertari appears so similar to the goddesses. Here she was finally elevated to the realm of the immortal. Perhaps the great royal consort used to win when she played the game of Senet over 3,000 years ago. This was a popular pastime in the everyday life of ancient Egypt. Depicted in a grave, it takes on a sacred significance. On his travels through the kingdom of the dead, the player passes through various stages of the hereafter. Some areas may be perilous, but if he's successful, he will ultimately win his immortality. If we are to believe the inscription in her grave, beautiful Nefertari must have been a lucky player. In 1988, a spectacular discovery above the Valley of the Kings helped bring Ramses back in the headlines again. During a routine examination, the American archaeologist Kent Weeks found the lost entrance to a known tomb, and he was the first to penetrate into its inner chambers. It's the biggest structure of its sort ever found, and it's where Ramses, the pharaoh who loved the monumental, buried his sons. It will take years to unearth everything. Archaeologists may even find the mummified bodies of the dead men, or a secret passage leading to their father's tomb nearby. 
More than a hundred years earlier, in 1871, the Rasul brothers roamed through the mountains to the west of Thebes. Almost all the locals topped up their incomes by robbing graves. Hidden at the end of a rock fissure, the brothers found a grave which nobody had entered for thousands of years. The men's dreams seemed to have come true. Everywhere there were boxes containing figures of the dead, countless statues of gods and amulets. They could even make out various sarcophagi in the flickering light. It was then the Rassels realized they had not stumbled into any ordinary grave. This was something really special. They had stumbled upon too much valuable jewelry, too many different coffins, too many mummies in one place. The brothers decided not to share the fairy tale treasure with anyone. They didn't even tell their neighbors, and for years the family kept the secret. But whenever they urgently needed money, the men would ride up into the mountains and take individual items out of the grave. The age of mass tourism had not yet arrived, but even then, many travelers with a taste for art visited the land of the Nile. So, bit by bit, the brothers sold many of the priceless objects quite cheaply to foreigners to take home as souvenirs. Business flourished. But when new jewelry and burial objects started to appear in America and Europe, Archaeologists began to wonder where this remarkable booty was coming from. Few of the buyers themselves had realized that these were genuine antiques, thousands of years old. The trail had to lead to Gourna, a small village on the western bank of the Nile, near the Valley of the Kings. The people here lived in close proximity with death. Their houses were constructed on hundreds of graves from the time of the pharaohs graves which had always been a gold mine for the local clans. When the official investigation began, nobody would talk and everyone had an alibi. The police suspected the Russells right from the start. They were subjected to intense interrogations and threatened with long prison sentences, but still they kept their nerve. Then they were confronted with the evidence. Where had it come from? Mohammed Rasul eventually broke down under the harsh interrogation. He admitted everything and promised to lead the authorities to the source of the treasure. In so doing, he provided the world with a sensational revelation. Several archaeologists accompanied the police. When Rasul led them not into the Valley of the Kings, but to a nearby cliff face, they were astonished. And when they entered the narrow caves and priestesses, several of the simple wooden coffins were covered with long texts. Most of the gold, jewelry, and other burial gifts had already been stolen. Which was still intact, had been decorated. Who had dared to rob the pharaohs of their treasures? It was a crime carrying the death penalty. Some court records have survived, and one of them contains a stonemason's confession. We found the mummy of the king, along with many amulets and much gold jewelry. His head was covered by a mask of gold. We removed the gold, amulets and jewelry. Together with other thieves, I plundered many graves of officials and country folk in this way. Another testified. We took the inner coffins and the remains to the island on the Nile and burnt them at night. We can't even begin to imagine how many irreplaceable treasures were lost in this way. Vast amounts of gold, amulets, bangles and rings must have been destroyed by thieves using brute force. Ruthlessly, the thieves tore the precious stones out of the skillfully crafted pieces of jewelry. They melted the gold down and sold it on the open markets. In all the trials of grave robbers in the two centuries after Ramsay's death, only one centered around the looting of a pharaoh's tomb. 
After all, would normal thieves really have been able to track down the great king in his sacred resting place? Until this time, about a thousand years before the birth of Christ, the Valley of the Kings was untouched. The tombs were too well guarded for anyone to break into and too perfectly protected against intruders. The master builders had sunk these eternal resting places deep into the rocks of isolated valleys. Few people knew the way in, and yet all 28 royal tombs were plundered during the period of the pharaohs. How could this have happened? It would have been impossible for a normal thief to overcome all the obstacles and steal the treasures unnoticed. So who managed to enter the Forbidden Valley without attracting attention? And who found the walled-up burial chambers with their golden coffins and hidden entrances which were closed and sealed with immense stone slabs after a pharaoh burial? Only one group of people had unrestricted access to the mysterious sites. Only they knew where to find the hidden entrances and how much treasure the tombs contained. And only they were unscrupulous enough to make use of this knowledge. It was the priests themselves. A report from a later period, after the dynasty of Ramses, complained that the lucrative gold mines in Nubia were exhausted. The treasury was on the verge of ruin, the country bankrupt. Letters from a general to his trusted scribe, written about 800 BC, reveal his terrible suspicion. Perhaps Ramses's grave was robbed by the descendants of the very same people he had helped to attain positions of power, wealth and fame. The same priests who honored and preserved the memory of the divine ruler in Karnak and all the other temples. And perhaps it was the first prophet of Amun himself who, as a mark of respect, put the mummies in the rock cave to ensure that at very least the bodies of the kings would find everlasting peace. After all, was he not the pharaoh's direct representative in the cult's service to the gods? After the Rasul brothers confessed, in July 1881, archaeologists quickly emptied the hidden cave under police protection. With 200 helpers, they managed to rescue the sensational find within two days, despite baking temperatures. Rumors of an immense store of gold had spread like wildfire, and the authorities were afraid of attacks. Once again, the pharaohs were transported down the Nile under sail. The mummies were taken to Cairo. Once again, Ramses the Great had captivated his country. Thousands of Egyptians lined the Nile to bow in respect to their unforgotten ruler. Almost exactly a hundred years later, the restless Ramses even took a trip abroad. It was a very special trip, French scientists wanted to discover his last secrets, and that meant medical treatment. He was received with full military honors at a military base near Paris. His majesty arrived by plane and was greeted as befitted his rank. The master of political propaganda would certainly have appreciated the publicity. It was a royal welcome for a legendary king. In 1977, the mummy was examined and treated in a laboratory specially constructed for the purpose. The damp air of a museum had done in a brief time what 3,000 years in the desert had not achieved. The body was infested with 89 types of highly toxic fungus, which required nine hours of cobalt radiation treatment. And what did the examination discover? Ramses found walking difficult, his spine was deformed, his heart had been placed back in his chest, his skull was filled with wax. He had lived to the age of 90, was 178 centimeters tall and had light red hair. The embalmers had dyed his hair blonde with henna. His hands had been well cared for and wrapped in the finest royal linen. 
He was suffering from advanced senility and probably died of blood poisoning after an abscess in one of his teeth had festered. The scientists produced a report of over 400 pages about the man who once called himself ruler of the world. Today, we know almost everything there is to know about him. But there's one secret he did not reveal. What did he take with him into the hereafter? How many gold statues and amulets? How many magnificent beds and thrones? Ramses the Great must have been adorned with an incredible amount of riches. Until now, Tutankhamun is the only pharaoh buried in the Valley of the Kings whose grave was undamaged when it was found. When archaeologist Howard Carter opened the burial chamber in 1922, the world held its breath. The tomb contained treasures of an unparalleled beauty and gold aplenty. What splendor for an insignificant child king who died at the age of 18 and was soon forgotten. He had succeeded Akhenaton, the heretic from Amarna, on the throne of Egypt. Although Tutankhamun had rejected the monotheistic worship of the sun god and returned to the ancient cults, Ramses simply left him off his list of kings. Perhaps there were political reasons. Perhaps it was just arrogance. Maybe that's why neither priests nor grave robbers looked for him. Adorned with magnificent treasures for his reappearance in the spirit world, Tutankhamun slumbered peacefully for thousands of years under the sands of the desert. His sarcophagus alone, made of pure gold, weighs over 100 kilograms. Now that he's been rediscovered in all his radiant beauty, he and Ramses the Great have exchanged roles. The man who was completely insignificant politically as a king was in death to become the epitome of the magnificent pharaoh, a superstar in gold and precious jewels. And what of Ramses, who ground his enemies into the dust and had hundreds of thousands of tons of stone piled up in his glory? Death has robbed him of all material splendor. Every day, armies of tourists gaze at him in his bed of glass. But even after thousands of years, his face has not lost the dignified expression of a great ruler. The roaring traffic of central Cairo is just a few meters away. But nobody driving past spares a thought for the greatest pharaoh of ancient Egypt. Surrounded by scaffolding, one of his huge statues stands in the square in front of the railway station. The exhaust fumes of passing traffic have eaten away at its surface and all but destroyed it. Archaeologists want the statue to be returned to the ancient capital Memphis, where it once proclaimed the pharaoh divinity outside the great temple. His dream of immortality has been shattered into thousands of pieces, scattered all over Egypt like a veil of stone. The inheritance of Ramses the Great has occupied archaeologists for many generations, just as generations of architects and master builders served him during his lifetime. Even the ruins bear witness to his omnipotence, his ambition, even his megalomania, his desire to outshine everything and everyone. Later pharaohs look back on his era with envy, as if it were a golden age. But that didn't prevent them from moving his statues thoughtlessly to the newly founded city of Tanis. Piramis, the city of Ramses, became a mere quarry. Once hymns praised the city, extolling its incredible wealth and its shining buildings of lapis lazuli and malachite. Now the palaces have returned to dust, the statues have been toppled, the temples are in ruins. But the great Ramses' dream has come true. He has become immortal, living on in the memory of mankind forever as the greatest pharaoh of Egypt, Ramses, darling of the gods. <laughs>